What is going on, everybody? Welcome to another movie battleground. I'm not Aaron. I am Matt. Aaron is sitting right over there, though. He's just laying down. I took over for him today. And I do want to apologize for the t -t noise. I forgot I was unmute at that point. But we got a great match today, nonetheless. We got Christopher Diaz and Jonathan Peck. It should be a fun matchup for sure. So I'm going to bring everybody up as soon as I pull the banners up on my side. The first person we're going to introduce today is, of course, Chris movie diaz hello hey. hello hello so how's it going chris good uh good new year i here to hopefully win my first one i didn't do so great last time but i think anybody what my exhibition man had gone to a little bit better with debate and to understand a great player like i faced him one time before other debate league i lost against him but it was fun debating him before and here to hopefully get win against him this time with some pretty interesting question. No, I will say. Absolutely. I think the last time that we talked, um, your background would change orange. I felt like I was watching Blade Runner 2049 at some times. But, hey, you know, we got that. It's all good. Um, so, I guess my question is, what are you expecting out of this match? A lot of fun arguing back and forth. Did there be some controversy opinion? Some I don't hold love for it that other people do. And it did be fun. Um, I'm not expecting, like, a Jay Burns or something, like, you know, yelling, but I'm here to have fun. So, so I'm a nice person, and I hope we treat each other with respect, as they always do. Absolutely. That is uh, always the key, for sure. Just treat everybody re with respect in these matches. It does get heated at times, but you know what? We're going to, you know, let's let's act like Gandhi, okay? Let's treat, let's treat everybody like uh, we're Gandhi and stuff. <laughs> But uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring your uh, competitor up next. So thank you for joining. And next, we got Jonathan. I forgot his nickname, Peck, because it doesn't say it on here. Jonathan, how you doing? First off, I won't reveal a nickname until I've won, won a match. So basically, it's okay. done under MIA. Basically, or be classified, redacted, until I won a match. So basically, I will tell you that after it is over. So it just made Jonathan Peck for now. Oh, and okay. basically, so um, easily, I'm come back. I know the record is a little bit deceiving, and you think, oh, and two, like, yeah, you're not playing, you're doing that great. Some of says I do, but also half the time there are very close matches. So basically, I am basically doing my best all along with it. So uh, I know Chris all, all the time, and basically, kind of like that, we would treat fun and respect. Although we do have to maybe get some little confrontation all along with it. Not in a meaningful way, it just sort of like it just right. kind of like confrontation when you have an argument to it to like basically do it to watch it, a football game basically. So that will be sort of my philosophy and motion of the match. All right. Awesome. Um, I guess my uh, next question is for you. Um, what are you looking for in this match? What is your goal as uh, you enter the match today? Um... I don't know. It's just more, not say weighing it, but because I was just not very much half assing it, but basically just sort of like a sort of a clear mind to it, just sort of like let my mind go and basically just kind of flow when the match goes on. So I got some study along with it. I didn't, I'll be honest, I didn't write anything. So basically I just go through it from my head and projected what I'm about to do. So that will be my game plan slash philosophy for this match. All righty. Awesome. So I will send you to the back and then we will go through the rules real quick. So the rules for Battleground. Um, here we go. Uh, it is a first player to three point type of match. If you get three points, you win the game. Each round is worth a point. Three points in a row is a win via knockout. A tie after round four activities round five or activates round five. I can't read the uh, blind round, which basically you're going to... Uh, argue without knowing what the question is we'll say a statement and then you'll give just whatever so for example I'll say name a samuel l jackson movie and then you'll list a couple movies or you'll list a movie and then i'll say okay well what's the worst or what's the best sam jackson movie and then regular round debate one through four questions received prior to the match for debate preparation stage one you're gonna have a 60 second opening argument then you're gonna have a two minute solo pitch and then once that's all done, you have four minutes to just open debate. You'll attack each other, claw at each other, just 
don't injure each other, please. I do not have the money to pay for any medical stuff. And then you'll have a 60 second closing. And then, of course, we get to the blind round. You're going to, like I said earlier, you're going to hear, um, you know, like name a Sam Jackson movie or name a Martin Scorsese movie. You'll give an answer that's specific to that question or statement. And then you'll have to debate blindly a question based on what you list as the answer. I didn't read that perfect, but it's okay. But we're going to get into it right now. I'm going to bring you two on here. I'm not going to be the one to decide your fate, though. We have three wonderful judges in the background. We have Jake, Brian, and Andrea. Now I'm going to bring you two up. Here's Chris. Here's Jonathan. So, guys, are you guys ready? Oh, yes. Yep. All right. Uh, I do apologize for my horrible, horrible speaking, but it's going to be okay. <laughs> no, it's but okay. Here we are. Okay. Here's your first question. And because... I don't know who I think Chris was the favorite. I don't know. But Chris, you're going to go first on one, one and three. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, you're going to go first on two and four. I haven't done this in a long time, guys. I do apologize. But here is your first question. Question number one. What is the best Jennifer Lawrence or <laughs> Jennifer Lopez? <laughs> oh, wow. It's great. What is the best Jennifer Lopez film released in the 1990s? We're going to go to Chris first. Chris, what is the best Jennifer Lopez movie? Oh, let me actually bring up your timer. That would be good. So we're going to take Jonathan out first. And we're bringing up that timer. Look at that. Oh, no. We don't want to start it. Okay. So what is the best? Your time will begin when you start talking. Okay. So I'm not the biggest dealer fan. I think to your financial time. So when going through the 90s, I, had, I was trying to figure out what the best movie And I came across a movie I haven't heard of before, but everybody talked about it. Eventually, they did actually... It's one of my favorite movies I watched out to debate. It outside the rest of the team is pretty good. But George Clooney, Jennifer Lopez, Albert Brooks, Viola Davis, a bunch of other people. This is one of the most clever little like cop and robber type situation. George Clooney is great. Jennifer Lopez actually gave probably her best performance I've ever seen this year. Between sexuality, but also the dramatic and a lot of white ass at the federal marshal. She had great chemistry with George Clooney. John Cheetah is really good at the antagonist role. Ben Rain is really good. This is a fun movie for great actors, great directing. I feel like I'm not quite a novel reading it, but the way it, it, it film it and the actor and everything, like the also just satisfying payoff. And this to me is Jennifer Lopez's best movie in terms of acting, directing, and the film in general, not just her performance alone. Okay, and that's your time, but what was the movie called? Out of Sight. Out of Sight, okay. Okay, it didn't pause for me. We're going to rewind it. All right, so now, thank you for that. Oh, this is going great. Now we're going to bring Jonathan on. So, Jonathan, I'm going to let this run real quick, um, and then you can, uh, you know, you can begin whenever you're ready. Okay. I think, in my opinion, though, J-Lo, her best performance around that time, in my opinion, this performance or in the later years, Hustlers, before that, her best performance, in my opinion, is Selena. And the reason why I did that film, because it, it kind of shows you the potential and basically it shows you that not only she can lead the film, but she can hold her own throughout the movie and kind of show people who are downing her when she first got the part, and basically it's sort of a publicity casting which she cast as Selena. And after the people come out seeing that film, and just she was like, wow, she is really fantastic in this film. She is basically almost like near a perfect casting choice as Selena. If you compare the two pictures side by side, you can't even figure out which one is the real Selena, which one is J-Lo. So I'll explain more details when I get to the argument. So it'll be my choice will be Selena, her best film. All righty. So now we're going to bring Chris back in. All right, Chris. Now it's the two minutes uh, rebuttal before you guys get into the four minute open discussion. So, Chris, whenever you're ready, your two minutes will begin. So, the glove about to come off here. I think Selena is a fine movie. I think it was over high for me going in. I think she gave a, a good performance now for her age of definitely when the character is supposed to be 15 to when she died 23 
it's very distracting, especially with the wigs. Like, I think everything almost updates her a lot. The film, I think the film is cliche at the cliche of a biopic, and you can feel it. They watched the death of Selena a lot toward the end, like the her death in like the last 10 minutes you don't see her getting shot you see the body and then they don't take time showing the people mourning and it hurt me a lot when watching it i think her the concert a very feel like music video they do little like little shoot horn little thing i think i was like the more better film in terms of performance her and George Clooney has phenomenal chemistry together they're back before especially the trunk scene you just sitting talking about what the favorite movie Especially by Bonnie and Clyde and realism and all of that. Um, especially her acting, especially when she holds him at gunpoint on the stairs during the shootout at the end. And he's saying, You know, I don't want, I can't go back. And you see the hesitation. And when she finally shoots him in the freaking leg just to arrest him, to save his life, just but he doesn't want to do that. You just believe that Kim can. And it's surrounded by great cast. John Tina, really good. John Ferrana, I think, who played that, is really good at. Their chemistry, like her and her chemistry, are fought it really good, and it, they're a bunch of good laughs. And I think when you talk about Denzel Lopez movie, you have to talk about the film overall, not just performing. And the way Steven Soderbergh bring out such amazing performance out of her that you just see her acting there and the little humor, her comedic time, her rather dramatic time. You believe her as Federal Marshall, and the whole cast in general, and the script support her so well. And I think Selena is let down because it's great, because of how by the number the biopic is and how other ads are updated. And that's going to be time. Mm-hmm. All righty. Now we're going to bring Jonathan on. Jonathan, your two-minute rebuttal will begin when you start talking. So like I mentioned in my opening argument, though, people were sort of skeptical that basically she was cast as Selena, though. Like, she was, like, basically well, basically around that point, like, how she could base her, her mannerisms along with it, basically how like, she could betray her respect and dignity along with it. And people, keep this in mind, not only just to say around time, she was basically a fly girl in living color. So basically, that was basically her starting to run around acting around that time. So this is not only a, a breakout role for her, but the people show her where people's like, oh, she can act very well. And also in the movie, she almost holds on her own and against established cast and actors like like Ever J's almost as his father and basically holds on her own. She is basically carrying the movie on her shoulder and her performance falls flat. The movie doesn't work and her performance does work in the film. That's where we make the film excellent and unique, though. And basically the film kind of more stand out along with it and basically kind of show her she can basically lean the movie very well though and the film regardless of itself along with it and basically regardless if around age thing along with it it probably doesn't matter some biopics sometimes but at the same time i think it really shows you how potential a performance she could be along with it outside of basically when she was known around that time though so this film itself it just brings like show and basically her Yane's along with it throughout the beginning of the movie. We showed like performing like around the Houston Astrodome along with it, and now like, basically compared to some of the emotions along with it, her facial expressions along with it. That's for me, it really sh- she really conveyed how Selena around that time period can really do along with it. So, as far as for outside though, I thought it was a good film. I'll be honest with that. When we get to the main argument, I'll kind of more explain on it. So, that for me, I think that was really shows. Really and that's gonna be time. Carried the movie. All righty. There we go. Now we got Chris on here. Okay. So uh, great start, guys. Now you hey, guys man, got four. Oh, well. The question is so did you turn this? Yeah, I, I'll have the question rolling when when you guys get started. Okay. But um, I'll, I'll pull that up in just a second. But um, say as soon as one of you guys begins talking. Your four minutes will begin. So, John, it's okay. Oh. The question is what did Ben Jennifer Lopez film really tonight? Are we talking about performance? I think she does give a good performance, Selena. But I feel the film betrayed her a lot because it feels by the number. It feels like cliche after cliche after cliche. You get the father doesn't want her dating the guitar. You get, you know, 
a lot of stuff, right? And they don't focus not on her life that made me care about. It, right? I think everything that ever game almost is better. And I the only thing I love with her in it is the scene where after she get married and she had that conversation with her dad where she finally said her, her husband. But and I felt they rushed the last like her death is like the last ten minutes of the movie. I remember partying when it got to, you know, her dying. I like this is like seven minutes left. This should be the the emotional hit moment, and I felt nothing watching that thing. Outside feel is a better made film. Steven Soderbergh makes it feel like you're reading a novel, and it worked well. You get like Dirk Clooney giving one of his most traumatic performance, and Jennifer Lopez also getting a lot to do. She get humor, she get laugh. You feel the chemistry between her and Dirk Clooney, and their connection with each other. That you know, and any other time they probably will be together, but because he's a robber. And she had a federal marcher to not work. And you took him it in that final scene when she hold him at gunpoint, saying, you know, I can't go back. You had to kill me. And she took him late. And I think the cast around it, well, I think much better than Selena. You get a great performance from Green Rain. A really good performance for John Tita and Steve Zahn. Steve Zahn very unrecognizable in the film. And he get a lot of good lad, especially his stuff with Lopez in the car and, like, he does he tried to play the innocent victim and he played along with it and gave him chance after chance. And, um, I think here's they, the thing. Here's the, here's the they, thing with us. The really here's the thing. My, my, and my, okay. Here's the thing with us. Here's the thing with us. I, I think it's main flaw with there. I don't think it's sort of the best Steven Soderbergh film around the 90s around that. But it doesn't I have don't to. even think the best George Clooney one thing. And basically, her in the film, she's not pretty much a fear majority of the film. It's mainly George Clooney's movie, but you, majority you, of the time, I, though. And it, basically around Out of Sight, along with it, it just, it's still a good film. They had great chemistry, but I didn't feel like it was basically her impact in the film along with it. When Selena, though, you do feel her impact in the movie, though. You do feel her I was basically along with it around that time, though, when she starts wearing up along with it. She had to defy her father because she didn't want yeah, but basically don't, don't to get married like, along with it. Like, she is basically, the role could have been very easily, could have fallen apart very badly if they kind of, if she managed yeah, to do a really good job along with it. But at the end of the day, she does mm -hmm. a really great job along with it. And I think that's a basically carries the film together and basically it's more well regarded. It, and like in 2019, in, this year, I mean, last year, actually, it got sort of natural film registry for cultural impact because basically not only performance of the film, around the film along with it. So basically, it carries up a little bit more weight. I think you're pretty much you're getting the credit for uh, And let me give a little bit of thing about Out of Sight real quick, though. Like I mentioned earlier, I don't think she's not in the film majority enough to basically sort of make it more impact. You would basically feel it's more... George Clooney's film alone for his journey alone. But you also had to have the chemistry though, but I think it's need to have a little bit more to him alone oh, with it. Mean, and basically, I don't think it's sort of like a best Soderbergh film alone with it. And I don't think around it basically kind of carried the film. Clooney and the rest of the cast majority to carry the film. Well, Selena though, I mean, she did carry the film and basically carried the weight to it. And that's time. Yeah. All righty. So there we have it. We're going to go to Chris for his final 60 minutes uh, discussion, you know, to wrap everything up, get all your points in, all that good stuff. And then we'll go to Jonathan after that. So, Chris, your time will begin when you start talking. So let me answer inside the question. It's down below. Like, what's the best Jennifer Lopez movie tonight? If we talk about performance, I can give it to you. But you think you're not in it majority yet, yet, but you still have to believe in the chemistry. It's you don't believe in the chemistry the movie would have worked. You would have root for them to be together. And it, it, overall, Selena is a by number by a pit. Like right? out of sight, had great cast, great directing, great acting for Jennifer Lopez. Like her acting, especially in lifetime in it, it have one of the most funniest deaths ever, with a guy slipping and the gun shooting off right in his face. And it, a lot of things. Selena is by the number. I think Lopez does carry film, but at time it feels like the script did not help. And that she giving you a come to you one dimensional performance where her dad really just stand out. I feel like everybody in outside is just stand out. And it Lopez showing what she's good at. Comedian comedic time your rather dramatic side. And that's what you need. It's a Lopez movie and Joe Clean at movie at the same time. Because 
they in love each other, and yeah, they. And that's gonna be time. <laughs> All righty, good job to you, Chris. Now we're gonna bring in Jonathan. Jonathan, you now have one minute to wrap everything up. The time will begin when you start talking. Like I mentioned, sort of my argument right here. She's not appearing in the film a lot of the time. She has great chemistry with, with George Clooney. I will give you that. But best in the end of the day, it's still George Clooney's movie all the way through, though. She did basically, if you're playing like a different kind of actress, it would have been sort of more than the same. With Selena, though, is basically, she has basically not only carried the film, and basically gets you engaged along with it. She engaged her journey throughout her untimely death unfortunately, around it. So that's the reason that's where Selena's the best film, not only never in the night, but maybe in her career rivals Hustlers around that point because she is basically had to basically hold it in to cause her to torment alone with her father, what majority people around her. It sort of like brings it down along with it, shows her like a real tension along with it. But at the end, it was just from like, Brains are her not only her best work and one of her best movies around that time though. And that's gonna be time. All righty. So good job to you, Jonathan. I'm gonna take you. Off. Oh, there we go. We're gonna add myself. I'm gonna hide this real quick. And now we're gonna bring in our judges. We're gonna bring in Brian. We're gonna bring in Jake, and we're gonna bring in Chad. Uh, Andrea was supposed to be here, but something came up for her, so she. Uh, could not uh, appear today, but we do have Chad here. So I'm going to go around based on what I see uh, on my screen. We're going to start with Brian first. So Brian, who's going to get your point and why? For me, what sold me was uh, Jonathan. What he did was he took took Chris down on, on the performance, whereas Jonathan was playing how this film um Brought a new, new life for like Latinos and such, where Chris didn't give enough time to explain his argument more the main round. So, Jonathan is my pick. Okay, now we're gonna go to Chad. Chad, who gets your point and why? Oh, you're muted, you're by muted, the way. Bro. Sorry, this was actually a really good fight. Um, I that whole four minutes. Um, Chris took up like two minutes and I was like, come on, Jonathan, get in there. And then uh, Jonathan like battled for his whole uh, other two minutes. So I was like, this is a really good fight. Um, you know, Chris brought up some really good points saying it's like a by the numbers, you know, pick and stuff like that. But I feel like Jonathan countered so well, basically saying like, yeah, but it's, you know, got its cultural impact. It's really J- JLo's movie and uh, Out of Sight's not her movie really. It's more George Clooney's movie, and um, you know I just feel like he uh, Pat battled uh, so uh, so well uh, there. Okay, and just like that, Jonathan gets the first point as he strikes first. So now we're going to move on to question number two. Uh, thank you guys for uh, hopping in real quick. Now we're going to bring up Jonathan as we get into. Well, we'll bring Chris in too. As we get into our good next job. question. And that was a really tough argument. Oh, yeah. It was definitely a good one. Yeah. But um, <laughs> now we're going to move on to question number two. And uh, I assume this has to do with Jim Carrey. So, <laughs> Recently that had being his said. Two days ago. Oh, yeah, true. But uh, I was reporting, by the way. Right. <laughs> but here is your question. Which leading role in any film would have been better if Jim Carrey had played in it? So basically pick any leading role from any movie. You're replacing them with Jim Carrey. So we're going to start this one off with Jonathan. So Jonathan, say boot Chris out. You have one minute to uh, do your opening, uh, you know, a little opening uh, thing. So who do you think Jim Carrey should have replaced in a movie? Jim Carrey is one of my favorite comic actors of all time and the reason why he is that because he brings you to a weird concept of weird stuff with the movies and he's in and make me elevate and what it is and make it sort of all-time classics along with it with the ace mentor dumb and dumber the mask man the moon and me myself i rate and a few others along with it the movie i pick i think not only kind of elevate the film but also kind of fit with this sort of this tone of the film but add with jim carrey along with it out of this actor, then he 
eventually it is. Um, it's a little outside of box, but I'm actually going to put the 2000 comedy Little Nicky, and I replaced Adam Sandler with Jim Carrey. The reason why I replaced it with Nicky and we replaced him as Adam Sandler because a couple things. Uh, number one, the premise itself is basically disciples of the sons of Satan basically come to earth and one what they tried to take over probably the devil from hell along with it. So Nicky tried to stop them. The, the and problem that's going to be your time. Is, that's my more detail on that. But that's my pick. Alrighty. Now we're going to bring in Chris. Chris, now your minute will begin whenever you start talking. Listen, we picked both really crappy movies, but I going with one that I think he would elevate it. He also would bring heart to it. And the Bond Bond thing. I, for Industry 2000, he did a uh, his family movie known as How to Grinch the Christmas. And then 2008, he did Hutch and Who. I think what he would like do in between, elevate what Dr. Seuss is, is the cat in the hat. I think Mike Meyer's performance is one of the most creepiest performances of all time, but I think. But Mike Meyer was missing with heart and warmth and able to do timing and bring it in a way that would be appropriate for kids and adults. I think what Jim Carrey did with the Grinch with Velvet with the Cat now makes him likable, make him likable. And he's to blame so many of the different roles like Mike Meyer did with the cupcake thing, the like the dance party thing I like. I bring it in a way that would feel appropriate. I bring what was needed. I'd be able to bring like the lovable cat in the hat like he did with the Grinch. And when you look at the stuff he's been in with... And that's going to be your time. Hmm. All righty. So now we're going to bring in Jonathan. Jonathan, your two minutes will begin whenever you start talking. So here's the thing with Little Nicky, though. I do agree. It's not pretty much a great film either. But at the same time, if the question will place him in it, I, the reason I picked Little Nicky because Adam Sandler that film doesn't fit the movie at all. Not in sort of his jokes, it's a rare mannerism. It's a sort of a weird twitch along with not a particular twitch, but weird voice in the film. It just doesn't really work along with it. And the reason why I had Jim Carrey in to take over the role of Nikki, because if he would have done it, it would basically sound a little more like a creepy little facial expressions along with it. You know, if you follow Jim Carrey's comic career, he does faces very well though. Makeup without makeup, he can play like creepy smile. Evilish in the same way. Imagine if you put him in Nikki, you'll let him unleash, like unleash you I can see. And you can make some scenes that try to be more funny than little Nikki, actually more better if he has his little comedic side things along with it. And the reason why I put him in there because it kind of helps the film Little Nikki a little bit more along with it. Yeah, it might have a little bit of flaws in there, but at least it will at least be more watchable than we were seeing that little Nikki along with it. And also I want to compare that something about the cat in the hat, like it doesn't matter which actor you're playing the cat in the hat, though. The film will still be terrible. Like, the same jokes as they're there still went out work. Even if you put Jim Carrey in there, it still wouldn't land it. And the reason why it wouldn't land it very well, because Mike Myers in that suit basically couldn't do anything with that god-awful makeup suit with the cat. If you put Jim Carrey in the similar situation, I don't think he would have done to do the same thing or stiffen along with it. Yes, he did, like, main makeup of the Grinch, though. But at least with the Grinch, at least he can move around with the costume along with it. If you try to do it with the cat, he didn't have that, that same luxury along with it, and I don't think it would match it very well. Unless with little Nikki, it would bring and show you many more possibilities along with it. It probably may help him with the love interest in the film, though. It would bring to some of his friends. It would bring to Earth along with it. And I think with Jim Carrey's spin to it, I think it will fix or even elevate the film. And more that's weird potential. time. Mm-hmm. All righty. Now we're going to bring in Chris. Chris, your two minutes will begin when you start talking. You s- Let me hear this straight. So you're saying that you he really elevates Doc and it has because it's terrible. Little Nicky is a god awful movie that even Jim Turing can even say it. And it's Alan Performance wasn't the problem. It was the script. It was the people around him giving bizarre performance, Quentin Tarantino. Everybody giving weird and bizarre stories. I think it's Jim Carrey. That was just you. Might not work, but look at the grand team. What did he give a lot to do with the grandpa? He made it work in a lot of ways with the charm and the style. What we're lacking for the cat in the hat is the heart. I mean, you look at the grand, even credit who does a lot of grandpa say he brought some more heart to the grand that made him lovable. But cat in the hat to bring the same thing to elevate the material itself, make Joe improvise stuff that make it more funnier. Get rid of the dirty heart joke, get rid of some of the more inappropriate jokes in the movie, and make it at least some clinical humor that works. And, and had good chemistry with the kids. 
what he did with the girl who brings in Yuluhu and the Grinch. What he did with, like, everybody in Turn to Yuluhu. When you let Adopted Two movies, especially the live action one, the highest rated movie of Turn of Live Action, M. Dick and Danny Grinch. The highest rated Doctor Seuss movie alone is Hudson the Hero, another movie with him. So he elevates even the worst material with Canada. And I think with that realm of possibility, especially when he did and provide a lot of stuff, whether it's the cupcake thing, whether it's the dance party thing, like so many things you could do with the cat, even limitation of a two. But even something like let me sneak it through for the men. We had to change the skies after the skies in. It had some a lot of limitations. He did do some with very low entertainment and done with well. Well, Nicky, I think the film would let him down, and he wrote Gibby Game a lot, and he had to play someone with, men with mental issues that were hit by a shovel, so he faked this one. Did that not give him a lot? I think when you look at the mask, when you look at other films, he did do so much with body movement, with very low invitation. That's I, Jonathan. And that's going to be your time. <clears throat> All righty. Now we're going to bring Jonathan in. Now you guys are going to have four minutes for open discussion. Uh, whenever one of you guys start talking, your time will begin. Yes. So, Jonathan, let's both to be here. I'm a, both of you are happy. Like, I yeah. watched the Nikki over the weekend. I saw the one of the worst film I ever had, etc. in my time. Like, not even Jim Carrey to say, but I think the cast itself and the script is and the directing and not his style of thing. Like, and a Dallas type of humor because the script is mostly written like Anna Stanley comedy you would see every day. Especially something like a crazy night to even a crazy night reference. Does it for Jim Carrey? I think kind of let me add a point out. How the Grinch stole Christmas, I believe, have like a 49% on Rotten Tomatoes. Who here, 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 the higher rating, have 80% on Rotten Tomatoes. Well. And it's elevated because of Jim Carrey. Like, you say he's a cat to any movement, but let a film like, let a, any of film like the mask, right? Let a, let me just say, uh, first and fans. He should do stuff with even the time that movie, I feel make it believer. He should elevate happy material, do it in a way that makes it appropriate. And the thing that I felt like my my missing for the cat in the hat was the heart. Like he wants to help the the characters the cat in the hat to put to help these kids out. Like to teach them a lesson, but in a way that he shows sympathy for them. And that limits you for my mind come up more of a creepy pedophile at times. And someone who wants to see them get killed in so many different ways. But when you look at them caring, like when you look at how the Grinch stole Christmas, but he brought the heart and he brought the strength, even with the time after, even when we went through the chemistry thing that was seen in the when he brought the heart that you believe him really changed. He can bring that with Cat and elevate the material, even improvise lines that probably make it more funnier. Mike Myers. Look. It, Right, a lot of line that wasn't funny. He was the one that came up with Dirty Hood with that word controversy. I think Jim Look, is the person that he would respect what the director wants, but the thing would be his own unique skill to the cat in the hat that would need it. He cannot say little Nicky. Look, so listen, much, oh, nothing Chris, that was Chris listen. You mm -hmm. mentioned like our Dirty Jokes and Dr. Seuss film. He basically did that with the Grinch Stole Christmas. So basically, he basically uses the same idea with how the Grinch Stole Christmas and the Cat in the Hat. And let me just go back to what I meant to say about the Cat in the Hat, though. If you put in that Jim Carrey with that makeup, with that Cat in the Hat suit, it looked awful and it's not comfortable to work with. It's Even by Pyrus yourself, but basically have a hard time with the suit when he was doing rehearse. <laughs> if you put Jim Carrey in there, it still is not going to work. Majority has to know so much. But the thing with little Nikki though, and the reason I picked that because you let him basically do most of the improv of the jokes you and it make it more better than where they are though. You mentioned in the scene you trying to possess with by one of his brothers when they're trying to try and get mad at Patricia or cat. Imagine in that scene with Jim Carrey is using his faces, there's his style of improv of slashing humor along with it. That's the reason why he elevates the film along with it. And the film's dark tone along with it, it would basically sort of like make this film a little bit more better than it is. Then the cat in the hat, what he was trying to like add a like more dark jokes along with it though. Even you would put a dark yeah, joke or not, not, it wouldn't make the, the film. same argument that you made for Lunaki. Matt Jim Carrey to carry the dark tone like the cup thing. I tell you, you murder you. You say what that one more thing and make it actually funny in a way that is stereotype, right? The thing that he did he basically use elevating the material. He elevated the material with Sonic the Hedgehog. He elevated the material with Let Me Sing Sinners over into an event. Yeah, he did it with the Grinch. You're making my argument right there with Cat and the Hat. I'm like, 
he but even for the makeup, I don't think the joke would work. Um, a suit like you, do you think Penny has the limitations to do well with a suit? Can't like there's so much you to do with the kind of At least Mike Myers is when he did Shrek. At least it had part. At least it tried to work. It just the yeah, makeup the writing was god so awful. Like, and that's through. gonna be time. <laughs> time. Oh, timer went ahead. Uh -oh. That's hilarious. Um, uh, Jesus. Look at this. Look, we just. Just went back in time. All right, guys. Uh, very heated. I apologize for yelling. Um, like I said, I said it would be heated. This one. <laughs> it, it, it did get heated. It did get confrontational. Um, it definitely did. But now we're going to move on to our closing. And we're going to bump Chris out. We're going to go to Jonathan first on this one. You got one minute. Your time will begin when you start talking. Again. What I'm pitching with little Nicky is this. Not only he kind of fixed the jokes, and even improv with his trademark humor in the film, it made me way better what it was. Like the past Jim Carrey's films were mentioned, it would never work if you let Jim Carrey let loose along with it. That's how I was basing, I was pitching with little Nicky along with it. And they also did something in the film, might have a little bit hard what Sailor tried to do with little Nicky, and it doesn't work with his relationship with Patricia Arquette, and even with his father along with it. That's the reason I pitched little Nikki for his role to might elevate the film because I think it would just not only fix up films like comedy lead issues, and plus you kind of get rid of that voice and basically sort of like you could be like happy, friendly right here, and also sad and alone with it. It's sort of like you question Jim Carreyisms alone with it, but kind of have it doesn't do anything alone with it. At least you tried to do it like Arkimo with it, but again. His VFX suit would have been awful. He wouldn't at least be improvised if we wanted to with that film, though, and still want to work with no Nicky. And that's does. gonna be your time. All righty, uh, great job, Jonathan. Now we're gonna go to Chris. Chris, your time will begin when you start talking. Well, it's a deep movie. It's both awful, but I think with kind of has he. You say he cannot improvise. My mind improvise a lot in kind of and Jim Carrey. To be allowed to improvise, but also be in a way that to bring warmth to kids. I think the heart that we're missing for can have for my my is the heart. Like you have to believe in his friendship with Pastor Brantley, with Dakota Fanny. And I think Jim Carrey carry that. Even limitations too. You see many actors with limitations too. They omen the doctors have to do stuff that actually elevate the material. I think little Nicky jumping stuff with a pedestrian and a stylus with that just holding him in, but being the pedestrian thing. I think with, especially with his track record, with how to get to with treatment, with hurting his who he to elevate the material, as off I can add, and be in a way that to be a cult class to write how to get to treatment and to make it heartwarming family film. Jim Carrey is that thing ready. You see, Johnny had to let me think it's there as a He did elevate even crappy material. And he did do and that. And that's going to be your time. <laughs> All righty. Great job, you guys. Now we're going to bring in your judges. We're gonna remove that first, though. Alrighty, so we're gonna start with Chad this time. Uh, Chad, right. who's gonna get your point and why? Yeah, this one was also kind of hard. Um, you know, I think ultimately what sold it for me was um, well, I went with uh, Peck on this one again. Um, the reason, the only reason why is because I felt like you know he kind of sold more of like what the change would be as far as like using his Jim Carreyism, like facial feature uh, expressions to, you know, act possessed and, you know, kind of elevate it that way. Whereas he really hammered home on the fact that the costume would probably be a really big hindrance on him. Yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> All righty. So now we're going to move on to Jake. Uh, who's going to get your point why? Uh, Diaz on this one for me. It was a tight one, but I thought... Chris was able to refute the costume thing by saying, hey, the Grinch costume was bad as well. Um, and then also he was able to refute the not an Adam Sandler claim from Jonathan. So Chris Diaz on this one. All righty. So now it's come down to Jonathan or uh, Jonathan. Uh, Brian. <laughs> um, yeah. Jonathan doesn't get to pick who wins this one. I don't think that'd be fair. Um, but uh, Brian. Uh, who's going to get your point and why? This was a great, great uh, debate. My vote goes to Jonathan because he explained how 
out Jim Carrey will will does his matters more, and he also explained why if Jim Carrey was the cat, it would be the same same film. Any, anyway, so Jonathan gets my vote. All righty, and with that, Jonathan takes a two nothing lead. Thank you guys. Put you guys in the back real quick, and we'll bring Chris and Jonathan back. Uh, not the judge Jonathan, but the competitor Jonathan. All right, guys. So here we are. Very big round for uh, Chris here. He needs to get this point or else Jonathan will win. If Chris can get this point, Jonathan, we will go to game. question four. I, I happy to win or lose again here. This was one of my favorite debates I've been part of. <laughs> so it's definitely a lot of fun. But, this is uh, my favorite Jim Carrey. So thank you. <laughs> there we go. All right. So now we're going to move on to question number three. And that question involves a man who has a movie who, you know, it's, it's being considered for a uh, best picture. I remember somebody at one point putting this question as what is the worst um, or the best, I mean, Kenneth Branagh movie. But now we're talking about what is the most overrated Kenneth Branagh movie. So we're going to start with Chris here. Um, I'll move Jonathan to the back. And then, of course, we'll pull up uh, your timer. So, uh, Chris, your time will begin when you start talking. <sighs> okay. Kenneth Branagh is a director I respect a lot of time. I love him. He made some crappy movie. He made movie that I love. He made movie I love like Hamlet. He made a bunch of movies. I got to a movie that I feel like on rewatch, it doesn't hold up well. I think it's easily one of the least favorite from the, the MCU itself, doing with Thor. I think it's a film that I've seen people evaluate it as a Shakespearean movie that had great acting, great special effects. Like, it expands the Marvel universe, and I think a film that is suffered from which fish out of water syndrome have very overacting, especially for Tom Holtz and Anthony Hopkins and Chris Hemsworth. Bad chemistry, but I think it's a lot on, like, like ranking of MCU phase one, like, near the top. And I think it's a okay movie that people overhype as hell. I think it's one of my usually one of my least favorite Kenneth Branagh. He's not a great action director. I tend to realize with that, that line. And that's gonna be time. <laughs> Alrighty. So now we're gonna go to Jonathan. So Jonathan, your one minute will begin when you start talking. What is the most overrated Kenneth Branagh directed movie? Kenneth Brown is one of the great, one of the best actors slash directors right now, the last couple of years and for over 30 years. And basically, if you look at his filmography in general, I think there was one, it got brought up a lot, remember more his underrated list, but even when I watched the film, it had some okay parts to it, but I don't think as a whole, just doesn't really work. And even if we watching it the second time before I'm making this argument, I think it just doesn't work very well. I think he was trying too hard with this film. And I picked the movie that he directed a little fall for, uh, uh, I think it was Hamlet right here. It was uh, Dead Again. It was written, starring, and I mean, directed and started by him and along with his wife at the time was Emma Thompson. This film itself is sort of very sort of like play like do walls along with it, and basically he was trying to do like an American accent with one person with wife right now. Plus, he was trying to do outside of it, and it doesn't seem well. I'll explain more detail when we get to the main argument. So that would be my choice. All righty, so uh, two choices right there. We got Thor and Dead Again. Now we're going to go back to Chris. So Chris, your uh, two minute rebuttal will begin when you start talking. So when we when it got this argument. But his more overrated. I never even heard of it yet again. I watched it this past week. I actually do love this film. I think this would be more ugly what his more underrated film is. I hear nobody ever bring this film up. I think it's fantastically directed by Brown. I think you should see his influence late in life with Belfast with his black and white with the stuff with the past. It's interesting. I think the plot interesting. I think they could David Jacobly give a phenomenal performance at the villain of the film. I think Emma Thompson is great, especially when she's not speaking. I think everybody gets great performance. I think even Kenneth Bond, even with his bizarre accent, he actually gets support. They easily want him more underrated because nobody talks about this. 
I've been around the community for a long time. I never even heard of this film until you pick it. I think Thor is a film that I hear a lot of people talk about, whether it's the acting, whether it's the acting sequence. The film that I think is merit by Kenneth by directing itself. I think it's a film that hard to watch at time. You did barely tell what's going on half the time, especially with the the fox time stuff. Like tell me what's going on. Like who attacking who? Or, like uh, all in the dog. Like even back then, Feedy was awful. I think Natalie Cormis and Chris Hemsworth had awful chemistry. She said Danny is freaking annoying. I think the battle scene at Lat Luster you just have better and not a great action director. Especially with that and that line shadow because he really suck at directing action. And even Asgard, like you want to see the beauty of Asgard, you barely see anything because mostly endure the dark lit room. Like it didn't take until freaking story to the worst of the story, maybe to see beautiful Asgard for itself. And I just like and I, yeah, people pay that the six billion movie that should be well loved, like top like top three of the MCU phase one rank. I think it's near the bottom. I think it occasionally had good moment of humor, but it fits out what it's still been done many times before. And that's gonna be your time. <laughs> so now we're gonna move on to Jonathan. Mm-hmm. So Jonathan, your two minute rebuttal will begin when you start talking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So here's the thing with Kevin Brown though, when he's worked best as a director, he brings like basic sort of like you bring like a sort of the mythical to it when it's sort of like a set piece along with it. I feel like the I feel like with Dead Again, I felt like he didn't just sort of sort of best of his ability that the way he should have right here. Try to sort of like with playing like a, like a bunch of Hitchcock's films along with it, and I felt like sort of consistently like back and forth. Throughout in the past, right to the present, it just doesn't consistently works well, very well though. And even some people are big kind of Brana fans are basically like, "It's well regarded, it's well well shot, all that stuff in the award, all that stuff." And you think about it, when you watch it about it, it's like, yeah, it's something, but I don't feel like it's sort of like it's sort of that either tween very well though, and even sort of the tension scenes, it kind of got very much. Uh, not sort of tension thing, but just one of those points when his character is trying to get inside with Emma Thompson. And it's like when she keeps going down, 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 down again, it keeps getting like, on, on, on. It's like, oh, it's a little bit more serious or even more comical of points. So, like, it just didn't feel like it was just sort of like on there with his other movies with some tension, though. But even with Thor, though, at least you have it feels a little skill when it first early on with Asgard, though. Like, when. Brian respects as a director, sort of a scope and a little majesty to it. Like the sets, the costume design, and even earlier MCU films along with it, it brings like a little more grandiose to it along with it. And basically, it started out arguably some of the best characters with Loki along with you said it might be over the top. That's what people love about what Tom Hiddleston's performance in that film, though. It brings like some of the best ideas of some important details in the MCU film. It's not saying like great, great. On there, on there, but it still is a very good movie, and I feel like, yeah, then again, it just like it wasn't sort of felt like anything to it, though. Done. Alrighty, and that is your time. So now we're gonna move on to the four minute open discussion. So whenever one of you guys starts talking, your time will begin. Make sure to give each other plenty of time to uh, talk. I would argue. I'm trying to never argue that. I've been around it. The film community for a while. Like, I, you bring up that people talk about that again, like this great Hannah Brennan movie. I rarely hear that brought up. I would argue this is more underrated. There are a lot of things to like about this movie. Like, the Emma Thompson is really freaking good at this movie. It's this mute woman dealing with her past. I like the past of what she's on the see trying to get where it's going. I mean, you have to edit it real at times, and yet it's done, it's, but it's done in a way that you can invest, invest in the film. You got great acting for. Derek Jacob be at the main villain itself. You don't really like the villain to the end. And the way he does manipulate them to turn against each other, the way he's doing it. Candace Brunner does a great job with both the acting for both fun and thing. I think it was sort because the reason why it is overrated because kind of how it be, how people talk about it. People, some people say it's underrated. Some people say it's one of the greatest MCU movies ever. And watching it, like, the moment of goodness in it, but it's shattered by choppy directing, choppy editing, 
some very lackluster action sequence, like Logan and Thor fight alone at the end, and just like the hitting each other one after another. It doesn't have the MCU Grand Festival look. Like you say, you take the Asgard as being most of it is indoors. Like it's not like the throne room scene or the the table scene. You don't see the outside of Asgard. It is the beauty of it. In the Far Giant, when you get to the Far Giant Tina, you want the beautiful scene. It's not all dark. You can barely see what's going on. You can barely see the Far Giant. And then seeing officially until later on, like Anthony Hopkins getting a really over the top performance. Like, you're not worthy. The whole yelling thing between him and Thor, like, some of the more overacting the MCU. And I think people play the Shakespearean drama, like, the Shakespeare, like, this is Shakespeare's MCU. But here's the thing with Thor, though. He is like a Shakespearean drama. That's the reason Barrow hired Kenneth Brown in the first place. That's but the reason no, no, he was bringing right. the material. You mentioned Odin's over the top. He is over the top. He's a Norse god for God's yeah, sake. And he basically brings the movie together. together. I'll call him Brian didn't bring his steam actors like Anthony Hawkins as Odin. We would have thought like many years ago and thought it was impossible to do it. And it was even not like even then you go back to like under it. Even some of the ones like he's not even the ones that like this because it's the best Kenneth Branagh film. It brings a little unique to us, brings a little, little, with little majesty and grandiose, a little prestige along with it. It's not technically the best face. One MCU film, it's not even far away from overrated. But my movie is a bit overrated because no, I think no, he was trying nobody, to do too much. He was trying to do too much. Like, it. It. He was trying to do much. Music is really good. Um, there's some really great directed scene in the film. They also have a part that can investigate a story. You want to believe everything. You want to be the magic, but then it becomes a fish out of water Earth syndrome where he and Earth trying to become human had it really no chemistry at all with Natalie Portman along with Cat Denny. But here's the thing. Well, look, here's the thing. Though. But here's the thing. You'll go back to rewatch it, though. Like, you imagine like, Earth not- or, or, or the storyline, though. Here's the thing about that, though. It was sort of like Thor, Thor trying to be humble. He, that's the point of the story with Thor, though. He was trying to be more humble, even without his power. Without the hammer, who is he? Basically, that's the point of the film that Brian was trying to do yeah, along with it. Like, and that's the reason that's that. the point of the film. And I mentioned with the chemistry, I want to, even if you said like Thor 2, it got chemistry, it got worse than Thor 2. But even Thor 1, though, it's like, oh, there's something narrow. It's something yeah. narrow. But, but, but then again, though, it just didn't feel anything it just he didn't feel anything it's a little significant right here but even with the end though it just didn't feel like mount up to anything we passed after two hours i was like what the hell i just watched like basically just it like, didn't sort of like amount to anything along with it i think that's the reason it's sort of his most overrated film with thor though at least and that's gonna part. be your time all righty so now we're gonna move on to the final minute we're gonna start off with chris first on this one so chris you got one minute to wrap everything up your time will begin when you start talking. That's what I feel like it's arguing that the film overrated in a community where I hear the film rarely being brought up. Like, I don't hear a lot about this film, and I think it's a film that should be more loved than it is. I think it's very well acted. I think it's very well directed. It's one of his early films, so you see, see the limitations he had, but the way he used, especially the black voice stuff and the music, like the operatic music, it's Fascinating. Patrick Doyle music is amazing and very intense at the time. Every time they can about it, have really good chemistry together. They have great mystery to it and everything. And I and a movie that I read more people talk about. I think if we talk about overrated, we need to talk about a film that is, people talk about all the time. So it's that film. A film that people well God and wanted back MCU phase one film. That it's a Shakespeare movie, but it may apply coding and consistency, humor that feels for it. Still get brought in out and over and had no huge impact. And a lot of the ending with terrible romantic chemistry. The film that did not and that's going to be your time. Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to move on to Jonathan for his final minute. Um, you know, make sure to wrap everything up in a nice little bow. Your time will begin when you start talking. I think with Thor, it's kind of properly rated, though. It's not even a great film or it's not even a bad film along with it. It's just properly rated. With that, again, he had basically got way over too much. And he was, like I mentioned earlier with Brian, kind of getting bigger he could chew around that time to try to be sort of like more influenced, like Hitchcockian type film along with it. 
And I think that's the kind of sort of detriment to him as a director when he was trying to do that little type of prose. Or at least with Thor, though, at least he could brought his sort of his trademark theming, like basically the costume design, set design, and even with some action, even it might not be the best action director, but at least you put some solid action scenes, even with in the Fox Giants' planet, and even with the Destroyer along with it. So, at least he had some, it wasn't the best action director, but at least it brings a little bit more nobility into it. I feel like, begin that again, it just didn't have sort of like that nobility to it, and it didn't have some real pulpits that got way overrated and from, from that People who are big fans of his hymns as a director, though. And that's going to be time. All righty. So now we're going to bring in the other judges real quick. All right. So we're going to start off with Jake on this one. So, Jake, who's going to get your point and why? Um, I'm going to go this one super tight. Going to go with Chris because the main thing that stuck with me was like, He's never heard of the movie before this match, so how can it be overrated? That's what stuck. That's the one thing that stuck with me the most. Okay. So now we're going to move on to Brian. So, Brian, who's going to get your point and why? For me, I'm going to go with uh, Jonathan. He was able to, to talk more, and he was not to Chris down on the argument about how Thor is properly rated, how it's not overrated. So that, that point stuck with me. Okay, so now we're going to move on to Chad. He is the deciding factor in this one. So, Chad, uh, who's going to get your point and why? And you're muted, too, just so, so you know. Sorry. I'm actually not surprised that this was split because this was another really good fight. Um, you know, they, they both really, I think, did a great job, but I did lean uh, pretty heavily towards the end there one way, and um, I went with Diaz. Um and the reason I did that is because, yeah, exactly. He said that, you know, it was um, like he's never heard of it. Nobody talks about it. And then he explains why he thought that some of the performances were great. And it's a movie that people should check out, um, even though it was like at the, the beginning of Brana's career. And then he, I th- think, had a lot of great um, takedowns on uh, Thor saying everything's inside. You can barely see anything. And, um, you know, he's not a great action director either, so. Okay. So there we have it. Uh, Chris takes the point here. We are now going to move on to question number four. Um, and um, we'll, we'll get to the answers real quick, but I, I think I have a, a, you know, I have a suspicion why somebody chose a certain answer based on our discussions in the past. <laughs> but uh, our... Uh, our fourth question today is what is the worst performance by an actor in a musical of all time? So we're going to start off with Jonathan on this one. So Jonathan, you have a minute for your opening. Your time will begin when you start talking. I know my opponent put some obvious one because it's the obvious one, but that doesn't mean it's it's the worst though. You think his answer is worse? Mine is that took it, took my, pull my beer ring basically, and maybe if I went and look it down. I'm thinking, um, uh, Mr. 300 himself, Gerard Butler, and the Phantom in Phantom of the Opera. At least it, his selection at least has some singing experience and an album. This guy had no singing experience, not even an album, once. Once! But then Joe Schumacher basically cast him anyway because it's just sort of like more the look to do it. But the saying is god awful. Like it really is trash. It was so bad. Like he was trying, he was coming off of 300 around that time. So basically, sort of the next big project you could do. And you kind of show you that maybe he's not that good of an actor. Or maybe stick with more action films. So that's the reason I'll explain more. I pick his pick my selection. All righty. And that is your time. Now we're going to move on to Chris. So, Chris, um, you got a minute to open up. What is the worst performance by an actor in a musical? So, when you see a musical and you see a lame man, you see a John Van John, you also see a Devere, you see a Devere that food, floating figure of authority, who had a complex of his own that he believed in rightness, that he believed in everything, he had a high banter voice. And when you start the movie off, you see Lots of cards affair. 
you think the empty very line gave me Don Van Don a hard stare. And then he opened his mouth. And it one of the more mind boggling things that now like a dead cow dying. Like he could barely hold a note at time and when and he the, a lot of times throughout the movie, the focus on seeing rather than acting and his the very come out a, a coward, a wimpy idiot that does the story to you. don't see the story to the anime at all, man. When he died, it's so freaking laughable. Like, he can't even hold a note. And if this guy, you know, coming up with what happened, to, to, when you see a dad, you see a very power, powering point. I mean, I go into my debate beyond more examples out the movie, but no, this is awful. And that's going to be your time. <laughs> all righty. So now we're going to move on to the two-minute rebuttals. And we're going to start with Jonathan on this one. Jonathan, the time will begin when you start talking. Look, let's be real. Both our pecs are god-awful or terrible. But at least Russell Crowe had singing experiences. He made like a folk album before he made Les Miserables. My, my dropout had no singing experience. He had no training to do it. And the reason why Joe Schumacher hired him based on his performance like Dracula 2000. You think I'm sort of bluffing or joking? Not. Go look it up. It's true. And the reason why, because of that, because I think he can pull out the notes literally and figuratively, and he failed all of it. That's so bad because he just wasn't that right type of actor to do pull the high notes. He wasn't that type of actor to basically try to give you a complete emotion as the Phantom. And the and at least with, look, at least with Russell Crowe, though, he was not the lead in the movie. He's a supporting character in the film. He is one, even one part of the film. It's just very nitpick in the film. The rest of the cast of Les Mis actually sort of like at least covered it up along with it. And at least it kind of elevate along with that. So with mine, it just, he's your lead in the movie. And when you lead, it just doesn't even work in half of those notes. The movie's already doomed to fail along with it. That's the reason it was so bad along with it. The film didn't do well along with it. And they were basically just almost from other people after the film. And I think after the film was over, they kind of distanced themselves from them. They realized the film was not only was bad, but his performance in general of that film was so bad. And then at least with Russell Crowe, though, at least he had a little sort of facial expression. At least I could trick you into care and make you think I care along with that. At least that facial, at least you could be it. Yeah, the singing is a little bit odd, but it wasn't even worse to compare to to Gerard Butler in the movie. Just really like that. It's just so not worth even when you listen to that. So, really. Alrighty. And I assume that is time. So now we're going to move on to Chris. Um, your time will begin when you start talking. So, I do you have a a hot take here. I actually don't mind Rob Butler performance in this. I think, like, given what he had in the film, I think his acting is actually not that bad. I think, like, his acting covered for his thing at point. I think they're a great moment acting, like, especially in the last half hour during the the point of no return leading to the final layer sequence that his acting really make up for his thing. Andrew Lloyd Webber, and I read it in an interview somewhere, said that when he was re- looking for someone to play Phantom and Fancy Opera were looking for someone who are not comfortable singers, someone who were play white and a musician that people would lock up to. That's why he agreed with Rob Butler performing. He wasn't looking for someone who could sing. That from the creator of Phantom the Opera himself, the guy who wrote Phantom the Opera. Like and you just see that. You just see why someone with Christine would fall in love with him. And yeah, why he in a title, I think the moment where he is terrifying, the cemetery scene. I think, like, even, like, the point of no return scene, the, the central thing, and, like, he really Christine and, you know, into coming back to him, and then he kind of feels sorry for him in the end. And I think that what Rob Butler already, he does not have the best thing, but, but I think, but, well, he does, the very supposed to be the powerful, important figure that John John would be afraid of. And he, he doesn't convey that at all. Like, he does mostly focus on I speak in one note. I speak in like this. I speak in love voice. Oh, my sign sir. Like, you can tell that, like, when they cough found on the guy that found help out, and of course, like, can it be true? I think a dead man for time before, but he's getting more, more whispering, like, you know, I sign sir. Instead of, like, that story to 
figure, like the sarcastic figure. Uh, like and it looked like even when he died that he wanted to be out of the film. And he and you had to have a tag in there to go that battle of John. And, when- and that's gonna be your time. It's gonna be your time. So now we're gonna move on to the four minute open discussion. Uh whenever one of you guys starts talking, the time will be in. I mean Chris, look, listen. Look, have, listen. Like, Chris, uh, Chris, listen. Yeah. You mentioned that the career Andrew Ward Lever started pronouncing the idea he wanted the part. That's the reason he's not in the movie making business. I'm sorry. Sometimes the creators right here, they're not part, they're not movie but producers, they're that not that movie that directors. That. And you mentioned you need a credit singer to do it. I mentioned the beginning of my argument. He is not even a currently trained singer. He didn't have no he singing experiences okay, in the movie. To... He had no experience. Like I okay. mentioned, her, at least Russell Crowe has some experience. Did you it. Up... it doesn't. Wait. It's said and I read it, and it's a rock band in high school that we were singing. And then, and then he went uh, to vocal lesson for the movie. Like he said in an interview itself that he did sing in high school as a rock band. Like. So he had everyone can do that. Is wrote... even in the choir, like, like, but my like, point... even like the right, like, um, okay, I don't use the example of great performance for actors in music. I just do that. Rush Harrison, and and my fair lady, not a good singer, really good performer. They're a good performer, but I think before it, and that kind of changed your. I think his acting make up for thing at the time. There are moment in the film that you should see the fans in come true, like when he might didn't know. For the manager to, to read his sarcastic about Kalada, why he want Christine to play the lead role. I think the moment brilliant that they had performed. What the quote? When you think of him being cast as a just brilliant, like that brilliant. But when he opened his mouth, it sounded like a dead cow dying. It felt like he just focused on trying to hit the nose. He forget forgo what made the very so interesting character, the complex Lucky. character, like what he's doing right. And you remember he and he. He not why well, he not the lead. He had a lot that amount of thought and John Red Dog. He look done. here's the thing with Russell Crowe and Lee Miz though. You mentioned yeah. like the look and then his facial expressions in uh, the he Dawn. Not, that facial facially works now. very well in the film though. Yeah, the scene is a little bit sketchy at points, but at least right here when he's not to though, he plays just acted very well though. And no, Lisa brings not, some quiet scenes in the movie the though. Time, but because, here's the thing with a uh, Gerard Butler in that film though. He basically, even when you try to do out of it, it still works very bad, though. You just never had that sort of command when you had the Phantom. At least with Crow, though, even if it doesn't, if you take limited to sing out of it, at least he can pay you for based on with his presence. With well, mine, he doesn't did feel did like a present when he shows up. He didn't even show up along with it. Like I mentioned earlier, Joel Schumacher saw it based on this voice at Dracula 2000. Dracula 2000. Are people not even sort of remember that film? It just didn't have sort of like the right idea. It didn't have sort of the right casting, and that's the reason his performance ranked so badly along with it. It was like and, and worse, and than even like, worse than Russell Crowe. But they both were given material that they had to give. Drop out like a leap at times, throw emotion. Like when you want the final half hour of the movie, when he dealing with like dragging Christine down to the lake. Same thing is like Mary Russell Hatt. Crow in the and film then, though, even he, before his suicide died. It just basically just her with the pain and the facial expressions. No, it it's not. Like, it's just one no performance. It did nothing changes, but he got like that face that you had to have the, the surgery figure of a Javier. He had nothing of that. And if you can tell that a lot of times, if, even when he's saying just focusing on trying to hit that note, he cannot hit it, but to rub out, especially like when Christine kissed him, you just see the expression of love for the first time, and regret, and the decision why he let Raul go. Like his acting make up for his thing. He didn't have to argue. pay what the movie was set up to do along with it. He didn't like, sort it, of pay what it's. What the He's basically the main lead of the movie, and your main lead of the film just fell under delivers on here and it performs horribly. The film suffers along with it. And you had to have a And that's going to be time. <laughs> All righty. Uh, great, great debate by you two. Talk about two wonderful performances in their movies. So now we're going to move on to our closing remarks. We're going to start off with, I believe, Jake, uh, Jonathan, right? Yes, Chris. Jonathan. Jonathan. Yeah. So, Jonathan, your time will begin when you start talking. Wait, 
Russell Crowe at least has some experience. He has his own band before Les Miserables came out like a couple years ago. At least he has some experiences when you're trying to do. Not all of the whole the work, but at least he compares the emotion or at least the face recognition of Jean Valjean. I mean, yeah, with that. And the reason why Gerard Butler as a phantom doesn't hundred doesn't work very well is he was trying to like compare in the motion along with it. He doesn't have sort of like its presence as an actor to compare that part very well though. Not only the scene just fails to do it, but he's just not that type of an actor, not that strong of an actor, so basically shows a real capacity of the motion. That's the reason years later, after that, he can stuck with action films, even some romantic comedy, because he never got the high of a note that he thought he could have in Phantom of the Opera. At least Russell Crowe afterwards, at least he can move on with better roles, at least some direct roles. Him, with Gerard, Bu- with Gerard Butler, he didn't recover after that, though. He tried to do more than action, it just didn't fail. It just and that's going to be your time. Mm-hmm. All righty. So now we're going to move on to Chris. So Chris, got one minute to wrap up uh, your points. Your time will begin when you start talking. Listen, both our performance gives off a performance. I will argue Gerard Butler actually did okay performance at time. He's not the best thing in the world, but he had a rock band before high school. And Andrew Lair even himself said that he was looking for someone and not a great thing in football. That he can present to Joseph Market and Rob Outlet did what he could with the material. And there's really a great time in the movie where his acting really good, especially in the final half hour. Like, with Russell Crowe, especially in the game of all right severe, where it's the main attack in it on the movie, where you had to have a tag around a protagonist, he doesn't do, do much with the role. Like, he won note a lot in the film. He went right into the confrontation scene, it all won note. And it Based on his acting, and that was filmed live, so you can't blame it on a tune. This is real thing for it. Like, Drama and Lily had had a train yet, but both of them, like, he just, like, man, like, got the I am the bear, like that. And that's going to be your time. <laughs> All righty. So, great job by both of you guys. Now we're going to bring in our judges for this round, and we're going to start off with Brian. So, Brian. Who's going to get your point and why? For me, I uh, go with Jaws. Says uh, Jaws says he he Chris David mentioned why West Grove gave a bad performance. With Jaws, said he explained more why your brother not a good singer and why this is a bad performance. So I go with Jaws. Says. Okay, so now we're going to go to Chad. Chad, who's going to get your point and why? I'm going to make it split. I'm going with Diaz this time. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, this was a, a really good good one as well. I was back and forth a bunch. Um, you know, uh, they both really hit home on that. Th- both actors kind of sing, uh, sing, sung really uh, poorly. Um, but I think Diaz won me over kind of when he mentioned that um, Sondheim or whatever uh, apparently liked or approved of the performance. And, um, and Gerard actually kind of like, Held held the movie together with his perform. I haven't seen uh, really either of them all the way through. Um, and uh, so I'm trying to remember. Uh, and and I feel like he said that like everything else that wasn't singing, uh, Gerard did well, whereas Russell Crowe didn't. Okay. So now we're gonna move to Jake. So Jake, who do you got? Is Jonathan taking away? We are, are we going, to, going to round five. I have Chris oh, Diaz. He, um, okay. and not for the sake of round five, but like when Chris pointed out that Gerard Butler was intentionally unexperienced for the purpose of said role, that's where it got me. All righty. So there we have it. Chris comes back from being down two nothing, ties it up at two. And now we're going to the blind round. So with the blind round, just so people who may have forgot the rules, um, they know again, or if you guys need a refresher, I'm going to tell you guys, I'm just going to say a statement. So name a Eddie Murphy movie. You're going to just list a movie. One that comes up at the top of your head. And then based on what you chose, that will be your answer for the question that we have. So, Are you guys ready? Yeah. All right. 
So whoever go, you know, whoever speaks first is going to go first. I'm going to name a statement. You guys give your answer. Are you guys ready? Yes. Yes. Okay. Name me a Wes Anderson film. Jonathan. Okay. What's your answer? Moonrise Kingdom. Moonrise Kingdom. All right. So Jonathan has Moonrise Kingdom. Chris, what is your answer? What Fantastic Mr. Fox? Yeah. Okay. So Jonathan has Moonrise Kingdom. Chris has Fantastic Mr. Fox. So your question is... What is the what is Wes Anderson's best film? All right. All right. So here we are. Um, again, the question is, what is Wes Anderson's best film? The answers are Moonrise Kingdom for Jonathan, Fantastic Mr. Fox for Chris. So we're going to start with Jonathan on this one. So Jonathan, the time will begin when you start talking. Moonrise Kingdom not only Wes Anderson's his best film, but is his sort of more one of rare examples of his films is sort of blends with great story and his style together. Where most of the time his films if we use too much of a style along with they kind of lost in the film. With Moonrise Kingdom is not though. It was a great coming of age story between the two lead characters, Susie and Sam, along with that, he had great performance as usual for Bill Murray at Wynora Francis McDormand until the Swin Jason's work, and also a great performance out of Bruce Willis of all people around that time. But just Bruce Willis phoning it in, but this performance, it doesn't phone it in. The movie itself, though, it brings like great, meaningful beats along with it. It's not only, like I mentioned, a great coming of age story, but it is also sort of a great. Themes are basically on the young love, juvenile nation, mental health. It just brings like this lot of narrative flow together. It is very funny, very enjoyable, as I consider one of Wes Anderson's best films. Time. All righty. So that is the time. Now we're going to go to Chris. So, Chris, your minute will begin when you start talking. Ray Anderson wanted to direct it, that I love a lot of his movies. But he never found me in a way that Law directed to do. But it, until it all the way until two thousand nine when he came out with the his first ever animated film and all things stop motion animation. It's fantastic as far. I see it clever. I see it very funny. I see it beautiful animation. Fantastic story by Alexander Plot. But also a great movie about trying to be re- 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 marriage of Ella trying to be who you are at the same time going back to your past, but you're clearly very great for that great you're clearly Mel Street, Home Ghost and Ben Murray, like a, a great small like only not that long of a movie. It's trying to serve a purpose, but it had meaningful dialogue, like you get even stuff with the antagonist with Dread that his regret did great thing with Dread, he died. Like they're a great song with the campfire thing. Like it that's full of fun humor, and for a 90 minute movie, you're practically for Andrew and no for two and a half hour. He made it. And that's time. All righty. So now we're going to go back to Jonathan. The You got two minutes. The time will begin when you start talking. Moonrise Kingdom it just really shows you sort of, of the mind of not only there are two kid leads, but it shows about the situational things all around with it. You sort of just sort of try to sort of a great romance of each other along with it, even when running away, one thing to an eye into a camp. It brings like it brings a sort of like more relatable story to it when Moonrise Kingdom I feel like fantastic Mr. Fox. Outside of George Clooney in the lead in that film though. 
you don't kind of feel the rest of them, everyone else, even their home got destroyed. Just you never felt anything. It looked cool and looked amazing, but you never have a really feel or care about others, though. But at least when we watch Kanda with those two leads, at least you care about them. You're trying to get them together at the end, though, and try and be sort of like live sort of a happy life along with it, well, around the chaos around them. When I felt with Mr. Fox, he proves my point earlier, like, it has sort of style, but even sometimes the story doesn't even connect to what you should have been along with it with the lead, though. I felt Moonrise Kingdom brings, like, together, throw it out, threw it, flew it perfectly together along with that, not only with great screenplay with Wes Anderson and and Coppola and Brains and not only some great score along with it, I was at the spot. So I think that's the reason Moon Eyes Scanner is one of his best film because it brings like a perfect inner tween, inner flow in the movie. It might be sort of like floating together and everyone can enjoy it. Even some people who are not the biggest West Anderson fans can enjoy this movie as a sort of like a comedy and a sort of, and the humor flows naturally. It doesn't feel forced by one bit. I felt at some points in Fantastic Mr. Fox, it does have feel really a force of points along with it. With Murai's Crazy, it doesn't and brings like perfect flow in the movie though. So that's the reason it's sort of his best film. And I can see my time on that. Alrighty. So now we're going to move on to Chris. Chris, your two-minute rebuttal will begin when you start talking. I love Move My Kingdom. I do. I think it, but the problem with Move My Kingdom, I just feel I feel like I think it in every other special Andrews film, but it, it was Royal Tenenbaum. I watched more. I even his latest stuff like Grand Budapest Hotel, like these things you see all the time. Where I felt like it's after Mr. Bob. I think there's nothing going on with the rest of the character. You got me on street dealing with, you know, she you know her husband up to something. The marriage's been falling apart for years. And, you know, she always suspects him and she wants to trust him. You got his son who feel like he's a black shit family, that his father doesn't love him, he needs to stand out. And then his cousins come in and he feel like he'd be overshadowed. And the cousin feel like the perfect and people love and he don't want to be himself. You got a lot of things going on. At the same time, you got his humor. But I've argued more like I think Fantastic is fun, only like 87 minutes long, and it feels firstly contained for. Anderson, even your kid, moment of humor for the children, whether it's a dog getting the debris bearing and falling over, or even like the little humor like that, the baseball thing. Like, there's so many humor that even kids would enjoy and adults would enjoy. And they have a heart to it that I think, especially for his first time doing animation, it's stunning. Like, it, there's so much imaginary stuff he does with the animation, right? It's the fighting with the rat, right? It's the final fight at the end. Like, especially with the houses, like the board, like the little kind of taught, like it's clever, you needful. The way that thing is used to it brilliantly. I think, especially the thing with Bill Murray and Joy Queen, where they just argue, they just start doing animalistic at each other. It's very funny. I think Movie Like Kingdom is a great film. I think it's a good, enjoyed movie, but it's almost like every, every other Wes Anderson film I've seen before. I think, especially from Fantastic Fans of the Fox being the first. Animated movie he ever done his first idea. You especially stop motion, like you would expect the French man and Andrew did brilliant, and it's done but also excellently with the score by Alexander Desplat. Well, he's easily one of his best score I've ever seen. Him done. And that's gonna be time. Alrighty, so now we're gonna move on to the open debate discussion. <laughs> the time will begin when it, when one of you guys start talking. Pretty much fantastic. Yeah, Mr. Fox's point. direction and animation was not mainly by Sanderson. It's mainly Henry Selleck's stop motion animation. It's not even technically more animation, ideally. That's just more by Sanderson, more like dialogue based exactly. in the film, though. It was just even like, if you take more of that, it's just more like a Henry Selleck stop motion animated film. Kind of like we have with Coraline, other of that, though. Even yeah, those but, films, but, but, a little better flow. But I think the one main flaw with Fantastic Mr. Fox, though, it just, besides the main character, Mr. Fox, None of his kids are sort of interesting. One of his they little... Are. Their kid, his kid feel like he's a failure, that he's a blasty of the family. Well, even that, he was so much annoying in the film. It's very much kind of in the trouble. It's just not neat He feel like he has to live up to his father, like what everybody thinks his father is. And he feel like he has to live up to it. He tried to think Dan... But he put those so more recklessly. He just he never amount to anything along with it. And like, I just never felt that way with like him in the film, though. Yeah. Even more his sort of his sort of mm. cousin along with it is trying to be more of that. 
with, yeah, even with Moonlight's Kingdom, even with, Moonlight's Kingdom, that, even with like, Moonlight's Kingdom, though, you also feel like it's sort of like a right here, though. Even the Scout Master played by Edward Norton and fell in with this lady along with it, which I'd be like more, yeah, even more drastic like, situations like along with it. You would just feel like bring like Anderson levity to it. It just before. it feel like much mo- and above, feel like much more. It feel like the Grand Budapest. So that, like, it, at it, least it, the it, difference it, between the difference between those folks you mentioned with Moonrise, though, it really brings a little bit levity to it, and it just felt organically. Even it, some of it just doesn't feel organic. But yeah. majority of the plot, I would the argue, movie, it's done better it. with the Grand Budapest Hotel, especially with the coming age loose and innocent thing. With oh, about, you're not arguing for Grand Budapest Hotel, you're arguing your. I know, but I think that I think his stuff done better other things. Like, and I that's really, the sort of way he started to do that. That's the reason he crafted it so well he does, in Moonrise Kingdom. He crafted and, it very and, much and as and a brain to like a sort of look really like it. the plot is very scattered, sorry, very all over the place at the time. I feel like why the kid a great the chem the sexual chemistry a little bit weird at point. Fifth with Fantastic Far. Like it doesn't overstay it well. It only eighty seven minutes long. It feels like you may feel a lot. You think it, it, it might it. have a short runner time, but it doesn't mean the sort of the quality. Yeah, but it also like you also think that none of the character has stuff. Like I point out the the son, I point out the cousin. He every point you put him up as the perfect kid, and he feel like he wants to be himself. He he had that breaking point. Where Even the point the in the son. near the climax of Moonrise Kingdom after sort of like the flash flood strike along with but it. It's and dumb. The base- like, but even I, even I, even with Chef saved them a lot. He, he decided to become like the legal guardian. Yeah, but it's kind of same. And the thing about Anderson, do something you don't see him do with animation, and it's done so well, especially up in two thousand nine. If there wasn't for up, it would have won for best animation film. It unique, it stylized, it score. And I keep mentioning Alexander Duplantis won his best score in Fantastic Beasts Four. Whenever we watched it last year for. A trivia thing for Full Metal. I was really impressed by everything. It's humor it's needed. It the music is really good. I like that freaking camp science song that became one of my finest moments in the film. And it, I wanted the best like accessible movie. I think it one of his best film. I think it's something you don't see him do all the time. And it worked in a way that I think Moonlight Kingdom has been done so many times before. Like I've seen the thing done before and worked more. Even here's the thing. With, here's the thing with Fantasmus and Fox, mm-hmm. though, is you can credit the animators to do it, not technically more the directing. And though, and and animators are basically kind of work hard more to start motion. Though they're more different companies made Fantasmus and Fox work. Even with that look at the film as a whole, he it just never really felt like a sort of organically when they're going to do it. Yeah, the film so, would have yeah. worked out the performance of Jerkley, Mel Street, Jason Frank, and Bill Mac- Like everybody gave me. And that's gonna be your time. Mm-hmm. All right, so now we're gonna move on to our 60 minutes or uh, 60 minutes. Wow, that would be quite a while. 60 <laughs> seconds. Um, you're closing 60 seconds, not minutes. We're going to start with Jonathan, though. Jonathan, your 60 seconds will begin when you start talking. Reason why Moonrise Kingdom is considered sort of his best film, in my opinion, is it brings like best uses of color palette, it uses a visual storytelling, it best uses of the screenplay that he wrote with uh with, with Coppola. Along with that, it brings like basically all the best things you people love about Wes Anderson in this film. He also feels like a little bit more relatable to it to compare it to Fantastic Mr. Fox. At least the reason why Moonrise Kingdom is out there, some people favorite Wes Anderson film was Moonrise Kingdom because it brings like more of a relatable stories. It brings like more relatable if you were a kid in that situation along with that. If you have that cross to this boy or girl you desire to. It is sort of the people around you, some weird stuff going around. It brings like sort of a little bit more levity to it and it learns some very interesting stuff in the film though. I felt Fantastic Mr. Fox is more of a scheme approach. It's more Tesla witty dialogue, basically what Samson does. Even sort of many hand mess with people. I feel like with Moonrise, it hits all the else. Even some that's gonna be your time of his move as a filmmaker. Okay. So now we're gonna move on to Chris. So Chris, you got one minute. Your time will begin when you start talking. I love both today film, but I think 
the problem with Vermont, you know, you name Benny King. I've seen it done before in Vermont or Tenable. I've seen it done with Watchmen. In later film, I've seen it done better. I feel like with, with that difference of art, he takes like 87 minutes and he makes it kind of like beautiful palette of an animation where it all stylized. But also get time to deal with development. He can't have an arc, like his son, because even George Clean's character, like none of it worked. And it, his writing is written by, he wrote it with Norman Bombard, and you can tell. It's beautiful writing, beautiful animation, it's so beautiful. But also think about living up to your potential. Living up to your father's expectations. Like, you know, trying to be who you are, but trying to be better. Like, you see that with Mr. Fox. You see it with his son Ash. You see with Chris Arthur, it's the arc of them wanting to be themselves, but struggling with it. And they have a great scheme. It's funny, humorous, and they have heart. I think for an animation film, especially for his words, it's one of the more impressive movies by Rex Andrews, and one of his best, and should be done more often. And that's going to be your time. <laughs> All righty. Great job, guys. So now we're going to have our judges come up. And today, we're going to start with Chad. <laughs> So Chad, right. who's getting your point? They really didn't give me much to work with because not because they were bad. They were both so good, both firing on all cylinders, like, you know, countering each other and just like making great points on their own. It was so tough, this one. Great, great blind rounds. Um, I ultimately, I went with Diaz. And the reason I did was because you know, he kept repeating himself about saying like, oh, your film is, is like everything else that he's done. But I think that is a great point that Fantastic Mr. Fox is different. It's got beautiful animation. It was co-written by Noah Baumbach. And it's just, you know, I feel like he just like really hit that it was done really well, had some great themes in it. So, yes. Okay. So now we're going to move to Jake. Jake, who's getting your point and why? Well, Jonathan talked about Bruno, which we do not do, but he still got my point on this one. (laughs) Um, He just ultimately was able to express why the movie was better. Chris was more like, this is why my movie is different, and he kept referencing other films, whereas John was just on... uh, Jonathan, excuse me. Um, was just on why this is the best movie. So Peck gets it for me. Alrighty. Jake is not doing any writing today. But now we're going to go on to Brian. Brian, it's up to you. Whoever you go with is going to win this game. Who gets what, your point and why? What Jake said. All right. And your winner of today's matchup is Jonathan Peck. Jonathan, congrats on getting the win. My my first question to you is, how are you feeling after this game? Oh, uh, very good. I finally got a victory in Movie Battleground, the Redux. And finally, I finally got a victory. And as I promised, for much when I started coming back to Movie Battleground, I would move my new nickname, basically, if I get my first victory. So basically, I will tell you, my nickname now. Okay. A little bit of drum roll, please. The new nickname <laughs> I was going to do is the phenomenal one. Alrighty. So now it's Jonathan, the phenomenal one, Peck. Yes. All right. Awesome. So, um, great match, of course, by both of you guys. You both did a really, really good job. Um, so as the match was going on and it got to two to two, I, I'm just curious what was going through your mind as you were entering that blind round. Um, a little, little, little bit. Usually the blind round is sort of like a 50 50 toss, like you like name a movie or name an actor, all that stuff. You had to sort of like think like sort of a middle ground as possible of your best options. You could sort of like the best of worst scenario. Mm-hmm. Luckily, I picked on the middle and I think I sort of made the right decision for Moonrise Kingdom along with it. So, and I use that more as my advantage. So basically, that's the key to my victory. Nice. All right. So, uh, I guess my last question for you today is: Are there any players that you are wanting to play for your next match? You got your first win. Now you're probably going to be getting ready for your next matchup. Who are some uh, names of people you would like to see go up against you? 
Uh, I don't know. I don't know what's my. I don't know what other players have some of my same record. So I don't know what I'm sort of fans with so far. And I felt like I need a more rebel opponents to basically give my sort of my boost in my reign up. So we'll see about that. So I might now enjoy my victory and they say I'm just gonna relax and style. Alrighty. Awesome. And basically, Thank- and basically I'm gonna watch the Royal Rumble if you see on my screen right here. I'm right. watching the Royal Rumble current going on. There you go. All right, awesome. Uh great match uh by you today and congrats on the win. Thank you. All right, so now we're going to bring on our second place finisher, Chris Movie Diaz. Chris, it was a great match. You fought back. Um, I mean, you made it a really, really good game, too. You were able to get back into it, and it came down to the final question in the blind round. Um, what are your thoughts right now? I feel good. Um, I doubted myself so much last year, but since the Harry Potter match and now this, I feel more confident in myself. I really knew myself this time around, and I made it really difficult for Jonathan someone to debate. Like, like when I get passionate about movie, I am passionate about movie. Like it, but Jonathan did a great job. I, I'm not mad at myself. I knew the speed round question. My first time doing speed round, so now just my experience going forward to the future was just bad. So actually, my second night, every part of it, but to do better next time. But and you know, it was a fun game. Like, it was a great match, a lot of really good questions, a lot of debate. Jonathan beat me fair and square. He did a really good job. I'm proud of myself, and I'm proud of him. Uh, Definitely. Um, and, hey, you know, you, you shouldn't, you know, hold your head down or anything on this. I know you said, you know, you're feeling good, but it was a great match. You really fought in this match. Made it really close. I thought for a minute you might be able to pull it out on top. Um, but, hey, you know what? You made it. Just one fantastic match. Um, not a lot of people would be able to come back from the situation you were in, so that is definitely something uh, to be proud of. But um, I guess my last question for you today is, uh, who are some people you would like to face in the future? I have to see. Um, J.D. Domas one of them. I think I try to see other people with low reps. Uh, my former manager, Papa Red, for being one. Like, I think it's time to show I. <laughs> Kind of said we not mad at Jamie anymore, which one is better. Like, we've done this before, but a few others developed, like, here to have fun. Like, and now to go enjoy moving and get ready from a lot of my other matches coming up, especially single. I should stop watching more single, like, regular movie. <laughs> Definitely. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So, thank you for coming to the background or uh, background battleground. <laughs> um, man, this is just and we speaking has been great to movie battleground. Background, not movie background anymore. It's background, yeah. <laughs> it was in the background. Now it's full frontal, <laughs> just like showgirls. All right, so thank you for coming on, uh, and that's gonna do it, guys. Uh, uh, thank you all for watching this. If you're new, if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. We got a lot of great matches coming up for you, and make sure you check out some of the other matches that we got on here. There's some really, really good ones for you to watch, um, specifically the ones with me in it. Uh, thank you for watching. And we will see you next time on the Battleground.